<laughs> You've missed the point completely, Julia. There were no tigers. That was the point. Then what were you doing up in a tree, you and the Maharaja? My dear Julia, it's perfectly hopeless you haven't been listening. You'll have to tell us all over again, Alex. I never tell the same story twice. But I'm still waiting to know what happened. I know it started as a story about tigers. I said there were no tigers. <laughs> oh, do stop wrangling, both of you. It's your turn, Julia. Do tell that story you told the other day about Lady Clutes and the wedding cake. And how the butler found her in the pantry, rinsing her mouth out with champagne. I like that story. I love that story. I'm never tired of hearing that story. Well, you all seem to know it. Do we all know it? But we're never tired of hearing you tell it. And I don't believe that everybody here knows it. You don't know it, do you? No, I've never heard it. Here's one new listener for you, Julia. And I don't believe that Edward knows it. I may have heard it, but I don't remember and it. And Julia's the only person to tell it. She's such a good mimic. Am I a good mimic? You are a good mimic. You never miss anything. She never misses anything unless she wants to. Especially the Lithuanian accent. Lithuanian? Lady Clue. I thought she was Belgian. Her father belonged to a Baltic family with a branch in Sweden and one in Denmark. There were several very lovely daughters. I wonder what's become of them now. Lady Clutes was very lovely once upon a time before she lost her teeth and before she'd had three husbands. What a life she led. I used to say to her, Greta, you have too much vitality. But she enjoyed herself. Did you know Lady Clutes? No, I never met her. Go on with the story about the wedding cake. Well, it really isn't my story. I heard it first from Delia Verinda. I was there when it happened. Do you know Delia Verinda? No, I don't know her. Well, one can't be too careful before one tells a story. Delia Verinda, was she the one who had three brothers? How many brothers? Two, I think. No, there were three, but you wouldn't know the third one. They kept him rather quiet. Oh, you mean that one? He was feeble-minded. No, not feeble-minded. He was only harmless. Well, then, harmless. He was very clever at repairing clocks, and he had a remarkable sense of hearing. The only man I ever met who could hear the cry of bats. Hear the cry of bats? He could hear the cry of bats. But how do you know he could hear the cry of bats? Because he said so. And I believed him. But if he was so harmless, how could you believe him? He might have imagined it, <laughs> darling Zelia. Don't be so sceptical. I stayed there once at their castle in the north. How he suffered. They had to find an island for him where there were no bats. And is he still there? Julia is really a mine of information. There isn't much that Julia doesn't know. <laughs> Go on with the story about the wedding cake. No, we'll wait until Edward comes back into the room. Now I want to relax. Are there any more cocktails? But do go on. Edward wasn't listening anyway. No, he wasn't listening, but he's such a strain. Edward without Lavinia, he's quite impossible. Leaving it to me to keep things going. What a host. Nothing fit to eat. The only reason for a cocktail party for a gluttonous old woman like me is a really nice tidbit. I can drink at home. Edward, give me another of those delicious olives. What's that, potato crisps? No, I can't endure them. Well, I started to tell you about Lady Clutes. It was at the Vinceful wedding. Oh, so many years ago. Did you know the Vincewells? No, I don't know the Vincewells. Oh, uh, they're both dead now. But I wanted to know. If they'd been friends of yours, I couldn't tell the story. Were well, they the parents of Tony Vincewell? Yes, Tony was the product, but not the solution. He only made the situation more difficult. Oh, no, Tony Vincewell, you knew him at Oxford? No, I never knew him at Oxford. I came across him last year in California. I always wanted to go to California. Do tell us what you were doing in California. Making a film. <laughs> Trying to make a film. Oh. What film was it? I wonder if I've seen it. No, you wouldn't have seen it. As a matter of fact, it was never produced. They did a film, but they used a different scenario. Not the one you wrote. Not the one I wrote, but I had a very enjoyable time. Go on with the story about the wedding cake. Edward, do sit down for a moment. I know you're always the perfect host, but just try to pretend you're another guest at Lavinia's party. There are so many questions I want to ask you. It's a golden opportunity now Lavinia's away. I've always said if I could only get Edward alone and have a really serious conversation, I said so to Lavinia and she agreed with me. She said, I wish you'd try and this is the first time I've ever seen you without living here. Except the time she got locked in the lavatory and couldn't get out. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. I know you think I'm a silly old woman. But I'm really very serious. Lavinia takes me seriously. I believe that's the reason why she went away, so that I could make you talk. Perhaps she's in the pantry listening to all we say. No, she's not in the pantry. Will she be away for some time, Edward? I really don't know until I hear from her. If her aunt is very ill, she may be gone some time. And how will you manage while she's away? I really don't know. I may go away myself. Go away yourself? Have you an aunt, too? No, I haven't any aunt, but I might go away. But, Edward, uh, what was I going to say? It's dreadful for old ladies alone in the country and almost impossible to get a nurse. Is that her aunt, Laura? No, another aunt whom you wouldn't know. Her mother's sister and rather a recluse. Her favourite aunt? Her aunt's favourite niece and she's rather difficult. When she's ill, she insists on having Lavinia. Never heard of her being ill before. No, she is usually very strong. That's why when she's ill, she gets into a panic. And sends for Lavinia, I quite understand. Are there any prospects? No, I think she put it all into an annuity. Oh, so it's very unselfish of Lavinia. 
very like her. Well, Edward Livinia may be away for weeks, or she may come back and be called away again. I understand these tough old women. I'm one myself. I feel as if I knew all about that aunt in Hampshire. Hampshire? Didn't you say Hampshire? No, I didn't say Hampshire. Or did you say Hampstead? No, I didn't say Hampstead. But she must live somewhere. Uh, she lives in Essex. Anywhere near Colchester? Lavinia loves oysters. No, in the depths of Essex. Well, we won't probe into it. You, you have the address and the telephone number. I might run down and see Lavinia on my way to Cornwall. <laughs> oh, let's be sensible. You must let me be your maiden aunt. Living on an annuity, of course. I'm going to make you dine alone with me on Friday and talk to me about everything. Everything? Well, you know what I mean. The next election and the secrets of your cases. Most of my secrets are quite uninteresting. Well, you shan't escape. You dine with me on Friday. I've already chosen the people you ought to meet. But you asked me to dine with you alone. Yes, alone without the vineyard. <laughs> you like the other people, but you ought to talk to me. So that's all settled, and I must be going. Oh, must you be going? But won't you tell the story about Lady Clutes? What Lady Clutes? And the wedding cake. Wedding cake? I wasn't at her wedding. Edward, it's been a delightful evening. The potato crisps were really excellent. Now, let me see. Have I got everything? Oh, it's such a nice party. I hate to leave it. It's such a nice party. I'd like to repeat it. Why don't you all come to dinner on Friday? No, I'm afraid my good Mrs. Batten would give me notice. I'm afraid I ought to be going. Celia, may I walk along with you? Mm, no, I'm afraid not, Peter. I've got to take a taxi. You come with me, Peter. You can get me a taxi and then I can drop you. I expect you on Friday, Edward. And Celia, I must see you very soon. Now, don't all go just because I'm going. Goodbye, Edward. Goodbye, Julia. Goodbye, Edward. Shall I see you soon? Perhaps I don't know. Perhaps you don't know. <laughs> Very well, goodbye. Goodbye, Celia. Goodbye, Edward. Goodbye, Alex. I do hope you'll have better news of Lavinia's aunt. Uh, oh, yes, thanks very much. Well, good night, Alex. It was nice of you to come. Oh, don't go yet. Oh, don't go yet. We'll finish the cocktails. Or would you rather have whiskey? Gin. Anything in it? A drop of water. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know your name. I ought to be going. Oh, don't go yet. I very much want to talk to somebody, and it's easier to talk to a person you don't know. The fact is, Lavinia has left me. Your wife has left you? Without warning, of course, just when she'd arranged a cocktail party. She'd gone when I came in this afternoon. She left a note to say that she was leaving me, but I don't know where she's gone. This is an occasion. May I take another drink? Whiskey? Gin. Uh, anything in it? Nothing but water. And I recommend you with the same prescription. Let me prepare it for you, if I may. Strong, but sip it slowly and drink it sitting down. Breathe deeply and adopt a relaxed position. There we are. Now for a few questions. How long married? Five years. Children? No. Then look at the brighter side. You say you don't know where she's gone. No, I do not. Do you know who the man is? There is no other man. Oh, none that I know of. Or another woman of whom she thought she had cause to be jealous? She had nothing to complain of in my behaviour. Then no doubt it's all for the best. With another man, she might have made a mistake and wanted to come back to you. If another woman, she might decide to be forgiving and gain an advantage. If there's no other woman and no other man, then the reason may be deeper and you've ground for hope that she won't come back at all. If another man, then you'd want to remarry to prove to the world that somebody wanted you. If another woman, you might have to marry her. You might even imagine that you wanted to marry her. But I want my wife back. And that's the natural reaction. It's embarrassing and inconvenient. It was inconvenient having to lie about it, because you can't tell the truth on the telephone. It will all take time that you can't well spare, but I put it to don't you. Don't put it to me. Then I suggest. And please don't suggest. <laughs> I have often used these terms in examining witnesses, so I don't like them. May I put it to you? I know that I invited this conversation, but I don't know who you are. This is not what I expected. I merely wanted to relieve my mind by telling someone what I'd been concealing. I don't think I want to know who you are. But at the same time, unless you know my wife a good deal better than I thought, or unless you know a good deal more about us than appears, I think your speculation is rather offensive. I know you as well as I know your wife. And I knew that all you wanted was the luxury of an intimate disclosure to a stranger. Let me, therefore, remain the stranger. But let me tell you that to approach the stranger is to invite the unexpected, release a new force, or let the genie out of the bottle. It is to start a train of events beyond your control, so let me continue. I will say then you experience some relief of which you are not aware. It will come to you slowly when you wake in the morning, when you go to bed at night, that you are beginning to enjoy your independence, finding your life becoming cosier and cosier without the consistent critic, 
the patient misunderstander, arranging life a little better than you like it, preferring not quite the same friends as yourself, or making your friends like her better than you. And turning the past over and over, you will wonder only that you endured it for so long, and perhaps at times you'll feel a little jealous that she saw it first and had the courage to break it, thus giving herself a permanent advantage. It might turn out so, yet... Are you going to say you love her? Why, I thought we took each other for granted. I never thought I should be any happier with another person. Why speak of love? <laughs> we were used to each other. So her going away at a moment's notice, without explanation, just a note to say that she was leaving and wasn't coming back, well, I can't understand it. Nobody likes to be left with a mystery. It's so unfinished. Yes, it's unfinished. And nobody likes to be left with a mystery. But there's more to it than that. There's a loss of personality. Or rather, you've lost touch with the person you thought you were. You no longer feel quite human. You're suddenly reduced to the status of an object, a living object, but no longer a person. It's always happening because one is an object as well as a person, but we forget about it as quickly as we can. When you've dressed for a party and are going downstairs with everything about you arranged to support you in the role you have chosen, then sometimes when you come to the bottom step, there is one step more than your feet expected and you come down with a jolt. Just for a moment, you have the experience of being an object at the mercy of a malevolent staircase. Or take a surgical operation. In consultation with the doctor and the surgeon, in going to bed in the nursing home, in talking to the matron, you are still the subject, the centre of reality. But stretched on the table, you are a piece of furniture in a repair shop for those who surround you, the masked actors. All there is of you is your body, and the you is withdrawn. May I replenish? Oh, I'm sorry. What were you drinking? Whiskey? Gin. Anything with it? Water. To what does this lead? To finding out what you really are what you really feel, what you really are among other people. Most of the time we take ourselves for granted as we have to and live upon a little knowledge about ourselves as we were. Who are you now? You don't know any more than I do, but rather less. You're nothing but a set of obsolete responses. The one thing to do is to do nothing. Wait. Wait? But waiting is the one thing impossible. Besides, don't you see that it makes me ridiculous? It will do you no harm to find yourself ridiculous. Resign yourself to be the fool you are. That's the best advice that I can give you. But how can I wait, not knowing what I'm waiting for? Shall I say to my friends, my wife has gone away, and they answer where, and I say, I don't know. And they say, but when will she be back? And I reply, I don't know that she is coming back. And they say, but what are you going to do? And I answer, nothing. They will think me mad or simply contemptible. All to the good. You will find that you survive humiliation, and that's an experience of incalculable value. Stop. I agree that much of what you said is true enough, but that isn't all. There is something else that lies much deeper, too obscure to rise to conscious emotion or to have a name, and that's what really matters. Since I saw her this morning when we had breakfast, I no longer remember what my wife is like. I'm not quite sure I could describe her if I had to ask the police to search for her. I'm sure I don't know what she was wearing when I saw her last... And yet I want her back. And I must get her back to find out what has happened during the five years that we've been married. I must find out who she is to find out who I am. And what is the use of all your analysis if I'm to remain always lost in the dark? And there's certainly no purpose in remaining in the dark, except long enough to clear from the mind the illusion of ever having been in the light. The fact that you can't give a reason for wanting her is the best reason for believing you want her. I want to see her again here. You shall see her again here. Do you mean to say that you know where she is? That question's not worth the trouble of an answer. But if I bring her back, it must be on one condition. That you promise to ask her no questions of where she has been. I will not ask them. And yet it seems to me when we began to talk, I was not sure I wanted her. And now I want her. Do I want her? Or is it merely your suggestion? We do not know yet. In 24 hours, she will come to you here. You will be here to meet her. I must answer the door. So it's you again, Julia. Edward, I'm so glad to find you. Do you know I must have left my glasses here, and I simply can't see a thing without them. I've been dragging Peter all over town, looking for them everywhere I've been. 
Has anybody found them? You can tell if they are mine, some kind of a plastic sort of frame. I'm afraid I don't remember the colour, but I would know them because one lens is missing. As I was drinking gin and water, and me being the one-eyed Riley, who came in with the landlord's daughter, and she took my heart entirely. You will keep our appointment. I will keep it. To Rioli, to Riley, what's the matter with one-eyed Riley? Edward, who is that dreadful man? I've never been so insulted in my life. It's very lucky that I left my spectacles. This is what I call an adventure. Tell me about him. You've been drinking together. So this is the kind of friend you have while Lavinia's out of the way. Who is he? I don't know. You don't know? I never saw him before in my life. But how did he come here? I don't know. You don't know? What's his name? Did I hear him say his name was Riley? I don't know his name. You don't know his name? I tell you, I have no idea who he is or how he got here. But what did you talk about? Or were you singing songs all the time? There's altogether too much mystery about this place today. I'm very sorry. No, I love it. Oh, it reminds me about my glasses. That's the greatest mystery. Peter, why aren't you looking for them? Look on the mantelpiece. Where was I sitting? Uh, just turn out the bottom of that sofa. No, this chair. Look under the cushion. Are you quite sure they're not in your bag? I know, of course not. That's where I keep them. Oh, here they are. <laughs> Thank you, Edward. That really was very clever of you. I'd never have found them but for you. The next time I lose anything, Edward, I shall come straight to you instead of to St. Anthony. Now I must fly. I've kept the taxi waiting. Come along, Peter. I hope you won't mind if I don't come with you, Julia. On the way back, I remembered something I had to say to Edward. Oh, about Lavinia? Uh, no, not Lavinia. It's something I want to consult him about, and I could do it now. Of course I don't mind. Goodbye, then. I hope I'm not disturbing you, Edward. I seem to have been disturbed already, and I did rather want to be alone. But what's it all about? I want your help. I was going to telephone and try to see you later, but this seemed an opportunity. Well, what's your trouble? It's about Celia, myself and Celia. Why, what could it be about yourself and Celia? Have you anything in common, do you think? Seemed to me we had a great deal in common. How did you come to know her? I met her here about a year ago. She was different from any girl I'd ever known. And not easy to talk to on that occasion. I saw her again a few days later, alone at a concert, and I was alone. I've always gone to concerts alone, at first because I knew no one to go with, and later I found I preferred to go alone. But a girl like Celia, it seemed very strange, because I had thought of her merely as a name in a society column, to find her there alone. Anyway, we got into conversation, and I found that she went to concerts alone and to look at pictures. So we often met in the same way, and sometimes went together. And to be with Celia... That was something different from company or solitude. And sometimes we had tea and once or twice we dined together. And after that, did she introduce you to her family or to any of her friends? No, but once or twice she spoke about them and about their lack of intellectual interests. And what happened after that? Oh, nothing happened. But I thought that she really cared about me. And I was so happy when we were together. So contented. So at peace. I can't express it. I had never imagined such quiet happiness. I had only experienced excitement, delirium, desire for possession... It was not like that at all. It was something very strange. There was such tranquility. And what interrupted this interesting affair? That is exactly what I want to know. She has simply faded into some other picture, like a film effect. She doesn't want to see me. Makes excuses, not very plausible. And when I do see her, she seems preoccupied with some secret excitement which I cannot share. Do you think she has simply lost interest in you? You put it just wrong. I think of it differently. It is not her interest in me that I miss but those moments which were not of her or of me. The moments in which we seem to share some perception, some feeling, some indefinable experience in which we were both unaware of ourselves. In your terms, perhaps she has lost interest in me. That is all very normal, if you could only know how lucky you are. In a little while, this might have become an ordinary affair like any other. As the fever cooled, you would have found her another woman and found yourself another man, naming the elements of your infatuation as a mixture disintegrated. I congratulate you on a timely escape. Now, I should prefer to be spared your congratulations. I had to talk to someone, and I have been telling you of something real, my first experience of reality, and perhaps it is the last and you don't understand. My dear Peter, I have simply been telling you what would have happened to you with Celia in another six months' time. There it is. You can take it or leave it. But what am I to do? Nothing. <laughs> Wait. Go back to California. But I must see Celia. Will it be the same, Celia? Better be content with the Celia you remember. Remember. I say it's already a memory. But I must see Celia, at least to make her tell me what has happened in her terms. Until I know that, I shan't know the truth about even the memory. Did we really share these interests? Did we really feel the same when we heard certain music or looked at certain pictures? There was something real. 
But what is the reality of experience between two unreal people? If I can only hold to the memory, I can bear any future. But I must find out the truth about the past for the sake of the memory. There's no memory you can wrap in comfort, but the moths will get in. <laughs> so you want to see Celia. I don't know why I should be taking all this trouble to protect you from the fool you are. What do you want me to do? See Celia for me. You know her in a different way from me. And you're so much older. So much older? Yes, I'm sure that she would listen to you as someone disinterested. Well, I will see Celia. Thank you, Edward. I've taken too much of your time and you want to be alone. Give my love to Lavinia when she comes back, but if you don't mind, I'd rather you didn't tell her what I've told you. I shall not say anything about it to Lavinia. Thank you, Edward. Good night. Good night, Peter. Are you alone? Celia, why have you come back? I must say you don't seem very pleased to see me, and you were so strange when I left this evening. It did not seem like you, so I felt I must see you. Edward, I understand what has happened, but I could not understand your manner. Tell me it is all right, and then I will go. But how can you say you understand what has happened? I don't know what has happened or what is going to happen. And try to understand it. I want to be alone. I should have thought it was perfectly simple. Lavinia has left yes, you. Yes, that was a situation. I suppose it was pretty obvious to everyone. It was obvious that the aunt was a pure invention on the spur of the moment and not a very good one. You should have been prepared with something better for Julia. But it doesn't really matter. They will know soon enough. Doesn't that settle all our difficulties? It has only brought to light the real difficulties. But surely these are only temporary. You know I accepted the situation because a divorce would ruin your career and we thought Lavinia would never want to leave you. But surely you don't hold to that silly convention that the husband must always be the one to be divorced. And if she chooses to give you the ground... I see, but it isn't like that at all. Lavinia is coming back. Lavinia coming back? Do you mean to say she's laid a trap for us? No, if there is a trap, we are all in the trap. We have set it for ourselves. But I do not know what kind of trap it is. Well, then what has happened? Better answer the door, Edward. It's the best thing to do. Don't lose your head. I, I'll say I found you here starving and helpless and had to do something. Anyway, I'm staying and I'm not going to hide. Julia, what have you come back for? I've had an inspiration. Celia, I see you've had the same inspiration that I have. Edward must be fed. He's under such a strain. He must keep his strength up. Edward, do you realize how lucky you are to have two good Samaritans? I never heard of that before. The man who fell among thieves was luckier than I. He was left at an inn. Edward, how ungrateful. Now, my dear, you give me that apron. We'll see what I can do. You stay and talk to Edward. But what has happened, Edward? What has happened? Lavinia is coming back, I think. You think, don't you know? No, but I believe it. That man who was here... Yes, who was that man? I was rather afraid of him. He has some sort of power. I don't know who he is, but I had some talk with him when the rest of you had left, and he said he would bring Lavinia back tomorrow. But why should that man want to bring her back? Unless he's the devil, I could believe he was. Because I asked him to. Because you asked him to. Then he must be the devil. He must have bewitched you. But how did he persuade you to want her back? What the devil's that? I had an inspiration. There's nothing in the place fit to eat. I've searched high and low, but I found some champagne. I thought we were all in need of a stimulant after this disaster. Now, I'll propose a health. Can you guess whose health I'm going to propose? No, I can't. Come, I give you Lavinia's aunt. You might have guessed it. Lavinia's, Lavinia's aunt. aunt. Now, the next question is, what's to be done? That's very simple. It's too late or too early to go to a restaurant. You must both come home with me. No, I'm sorry, Julia. I'm too tired to go out, and I'm not at all hungry. I shall have a few biscuits. But you, Celia, you come and have a little supper with me, something very light. Thank you, Julia. I think I will, if I may follow you in about ten minutes. Before I go, there's something I want to say to Edward. About Lavinia? <laughs> well, go along quickly and take a taxi. You know you're looking absolutely famished. Good night, Edward. Well, how did he persuade you? How did he persuade me? <laughs> did he persuade me? I have a very clear impression that he tried to persuade me it was all for the best that Lavinia had left me, that I ought to be thankful. And yet the effect of all his argument was to make me see that I wanted her back. That's the devil's method. So you want Lavinia back? Lavinia? So the one thing you care about is to avoid a break, anything unpleasant? No, it can't be that. I won't think it's that. I think it is just a moment of surrender to fatigue and panic. You can't face the trouble. No, it isn't that. It isn't only that. Well, it cannot be simply a question of vanity that you think the world will laugh at you because your wife has left you for another man. I will soon put that right, Edward, when you are free. No, it isn't only that. And all these reasons were suggested to me by the man I call Riley. Though his name isn't Riley. It was just a name in a song he sang. He sang you a song about a man named Riley. <laughs> really, Edward, I think that you are mad. I mean, I think you're on the edge of a nervous breakdown. 
Edward, if I go away now, will you promise me to see a very great doctor whom I've heard of, and his name is Riley? It would take someone greater than the greatest doctor to cure this illness. Edward, if I go now, will you assure me that everything is right, that you do not mean to have Lavinia back, and that you do mean to gain your freedom, and that everything is all right between us? That's all that matters, truly, Edward. If that is right, everything else will be, I promise you. No, Celia. It has been very wonderful, and I am very grateful. And I think you are a very rare person. But it was too late. And I should have known that it wasn't fair to you. It wasn't fair to me. You can stand there and talk about being fair to me. But for Lavinia leaving, this would never have arisen. What future had you ever thought there could be? What did I thought the future could be? I abandoned the future before we began. And after that, I lived in a present where time was meaningless. A private world of ours where the word happiness had a different meaning. Or oh, so it seemed. I have heard of that experience. A dream. I was happy in it till today. And then when Julia asked about Lavinia, and it came to me that Lavinia had left you and that you would be free, I suddenly discovered that the dream was not enough, that I wanted something more. And I waited and wanted to run to tell you. Perhaps the dream was better. It seemed the real reality. And if this is reality, it is very like a dream. Perhaps it is I who betrayed my own dream all the while. And to find I wanted this world as well as that, well, it's humiliating. There's no reason why you should feel humiliated. But don't think that you can humiliate me. Humiliation, it's something I've done to myself. I'm not sure even that you seem real enough to humiliate me. <laughs> I suppose most women would feel degraded to find that a man with whom they thought they had shared something wonderful had taken them only as a passing diversion. I didn't take you as a passing diversion. If you want to speak of passing diversions, how did you take Peter? Peter, Peter who? Peter Quilp, who was here this evening. He was in a dream, and now he's simply unhappy and bewildered. I don't know what you're talking about. Edward, this is really too crude a subterfuge to justify yourself. There was never anything between me and Peter. Wasn't there? He thought so. He came back this evening to talk to me about but it. But this is ridiculous. I never gave Peter any reason to suppose that I cared for him. I, I thought he had talent. I saw that he was lonely. I thought I could help him. I took him to concerts. But then, as he came to make more acquaintances, I found him less interesting and rather conceited. But why should we talk about Peter? All that matters is that you think you want Lavinia. And if that's the sort of person you are, well, you'd better have her. No, it's not like that. It's not that I am in love with Lavinia. I don't think I was ever really in love with her. If I have ever been in love, and I think that I have, I have never been in love with anyone but you. And perhaps I still am. But this can't go on. It never could have been a permanent thing. You should have a man nearer your own age. I don't think I care for advice from you, Edward. You're not entitled to take any interest now in my future. I only hope you're competent to manage your own. But if you're not in love and never have been in love with Lavinia. What is it that you want? I am not sure. The one thing of which I am relatively certain is that only since this morning I have met myself as a middle-aged man beginning to know what it is to feel old. That is the worst moment. When you feel that you have lost the desire for all that was most desirable and before you are contented with what you can desire before you know what is left to be desired, and you go on wishing that you could desire what desire has left behind. But you cannot understand. How could you understand what it is to feel old? But I want to understand you. I, I could understand. And, Edward, please believe that whatever happens, I, I shall not loathe you. I, I shall only feel sorry for you. It's only myself I'm in danger of hating. What will your life be? I can't bear to think of it. Oh, Edward, can you be happy with Lavinia? No, not happy. Or if there is any happiness, only the happiness of knowing that the misery does not feed on the ruin of loveliness, that the tedium is not the residue of ecstasy. I see now that my life was determined long ago and that the struggle to escape from it is only a make-believe, a pretense that what is is not or could be changed. The self that can say, I want this or want that, the self that wills, he is a feeble creature. He has to come to terms in the end with the obstinate, the tougher self. 
who does not speak, who never talks, who cannot argue, and who in some men may be the guardian, but in men like me, the dull, the implacable, the indomitable spirit of mediocrity. I am not sure, Edward, that I understand you, and yet I understand as I never did before. I think, I believe you are being yourself as you never were before with me. Twice you have changed since I've been looking at you. I looked at your face, and I thought I knew and loved every contour. And as I looked, it withered as if I had unwrapped a mummy. I listened to your voice that had always thrilled me, and it became another voice. No, not, no, not a voice. What I heard was the noise of an insect, dry, endless, meaningless, inhuman. You might have made it by scraping your legs together, or however grasshoppers do it. I looked and listened for your heart, your blood, and saw only a beetle the size of a man with nothing more inside it than what comes out when you tread on a beetle. Perhaps that is what I am. Tread on me, if you like. No, I won't tread on you. That is not what you are. It is only what is left of what I had thought you were. I see another person. I see you as a person I never saw before. The man I saw before, he was only a projection. I see that now of something that I wanted. No not wanted, something I aspired to, something I desperately wanted to exist. It must happen somewhere, but where and what is it? Edward, I see I have simply been making use of you, and I ask you to forgive me. You ask me to forgive you? Yes, for two reasons. First... Oh, damn the telephone. I suppose I'd better answer it. Yes, you'd better answer it. Hello? Oh, it's you again, Julia. What is it now? Your spectacles again? Well, where do you leave them, or have we... Have I got to hunt all over? You're sure in the kitchen? Beside the champagne bottle. You're quite sure? Very well. Hold on, if you like. We... I'll look for them. Yes, you look for them. I shall never go into your kitchen again. She was right for once. She's always right. But why bring an empty champagne bottle? It isn't empty. It may be a little flat. Well, I hope that you will drink a final glass with me. What shall we drink to? Whom shall we drink to? To the guardians. To the guardians? To the guardians. It was you who spoke of guardians. It may be that even Julia is a guardian. <laughs> Perhaps she's my guardian. Give me the spectacles. Good night, Edward. Good night, Celia. Celia. Has Lavinia arrived? Celia, why have you come? I expect Lavinia at any moment. You must not be here. Why have you come here? Because Lavinia asked me. Because Lavinia asked you? Well, not directly. Julia had a telegram asking her to come and to bring me with her. Julia was delayed and sent me on separately. Well, it seems very odd and not like Lavinia. Oh, I suppose there is nothing to do but wait. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Oh, I'm glad I came. I can see you at last as a human being. Can't you see me that way too and laugh about it? I wish I could. I wish I understood anything. I'm completely in the dark. But it's all so simple. Can't you see that... There's Lavinia. Peter. Where's Lavinia? Don't tell me that Lavinia sent you a telegram. No, not to me, but to Alex. She told him to come here and to bring me with him. He'll be here in a minute. But Edward, you remember our conversation yesterday? Of course. I hope you've done nothing about it. No, I've done nothing. I'm so glad, because I've changed my mind. I mean, I've decided that it's all no use. I'm going to California. You're going to California? Yes, I have a new job. Well, how did that happen overnight? Why, well, it's a man that Alex put me in touch with, and we settled everything this morning. Peter, I shall miss you. Oh, it's nice of you to say so. But you'll find someone better to go about with. No, I'm going away too. You're going abroad? I don't know, perhaps. You're both going away. Who's going away? Well, Celia, well, Peter, I didn't expect to find either of you here. But, but the, the telegram. telegram. What telegram? The one you sent to Julia. And the one you sent to Alex. I don't know what you mean. Edward, have you been sending telegrams? Of course I haven't sent any telegrams. This is some of Julia's mischief. I suppose we might as well sit down. What should we talk about? 
Peter's going to America. Yes, and I would have rung you up tomorrow and come in to say goodbye before I left. And Celia's going too. Was that what I heard? You're going together? We are not going together. Celia has told us she is going away, but I don't know where. You don't know where? Do you know where you're going yourself? Yes, of course. I'm going to California. Oh, Celia, why don't you go to California? Everyone says it's a wonderful climate. The people who go there never want to leave it. Lavinia, I should like to say goodbye as friends. Why, Celia, but haven't we always been friends? I thought you were one of my dearest friends. At least, in so far as a girl can be a friend of a woman so much older than herself. Lavinia, don't put me off. I may not see you again. What I want to say is this. I should like you to remember me as someone who wants you and Edward to be happy. You're very kind, but very mysterious. I'm sure we shall manage somehow, thank you, as we have in the past. Oh, not as in the past. Oh, well, I'll go now. Goodbye, Lavinia. Goodbye, Edward. Goodbye, Celia. Goodbye, Lavinia. Goodbye, Celia. I must say, you don't seem very pleased to see me. I can't say I've had much opportunity to see anything, but of course I'm glad to see you. Yes, that was a silly thing to say. Like a schoolgirl, like Celia, I don't know why I said it. I am to ask no questions. And I know I am to give no explanations. And I am to give no explanations. And I am to ask no questions. And yet, why not? I don't know why not. So what are we to talk about? Oh, Edward, since I've been away, I see that I've taken you much too seriously. And now I can see how absurd you are. That is a very serious conclusion to have arrived at in how many? 32 hours. Yes, a very important discovery. Finding that you spent five years of your life with a man who had no sense of humour and that the effect upon me was that I lost all sense of humour myself. That's what came of always giving in to you. I was unaware that you had always given in to me. It struck me very differently. As we're on the subject, I thought that it was I who had given in to you. I know what you mean by giving in to me. You mean leaving all the practical decisions that you should have made yourself. I remember, oh, I ought to have realised what was coming. When we were planning our honeymoon, I couldn't make you say where you wanted to go. But I wanted you to make that decision. Well, how could I tell where I wanted to go unless you suggested some other place first? And I remember that finally, in desperation, I said, I suppose you'd as soon go to Peacehaven. And you said, I don't mind. Well, of course I didn't mind. I meant it as a compliment. <laughs> you meant it as a compliment. Oh, it's just that way of taking things that makes you so exasperating. You were so considerate, people said, and you thought you were unselfish. It was only passivity. You only wanted to be bolstered, encouraged. And why did you always make me feel insignificant? I may not have known what life I wanted, but it wasn't the life you chose for me. <laughs> you wanted your husband to be successful. You wanted me to supply a public background for your kind of public life. You wanted to be a hostess for whom my career would be a support. Well, I try to be accommodating, but in future I shall behave, I assure you, very differently. Bravo, Edward, this is surprising. Now, who could have taught you to answer back like that? I have had quite enough humiliation lately to bring me to the point at which humiliation ceases to humiliate. You get to the point at which you cease to feel, and then you speak your mind. That will be a novelty to find that you have a mind to speak. Anyway, I'm prepared to take you as you are. You mean you are prepared to take me as I was, or as you think I am. But what do you think I am? Oh, what you always were. Apart from this little attempt at spunkiness. As for me, I'm rather a different person whom you must get to know. Oh, this is very interesting, but you seem to assume that you've done all the changing. Though I haven't yet found it a change for the better. But doesn't it occur to you that possibly I may have changed too? Oh, Edward, when you were a little boy, I'm sure you were always getting yourself measured to prove how you'd grown since the last holidays. You were always intensely concerned with yourself. And if other people grow, will you want to grow too? In what way have you changed? The change that comes from seeing oneself through the eyes of other people. That must have been very shattering for you. But never mind, you'll soon get over it. And find yourself another little part to play, with another face to take people in. One of the most infuriating things about you has always been your perfect assurance that you understood me better than I understood myself. And the very most infuriating thing about you has always been your placid assumption that I wasn't worth the trouble of understanding. <laughs> so here we are again, back in the trap, with one difference, perhaps. We can fight each other instead of each taking his corner of the cage. Well, it's a better way of passing the evening than listening to the gramophone. We have very good records. But I always suspected you really hated music, and the gramophone was only your escape from talking to me when we had to be alone. I've often wondered why you married me. Well, you really were rather attractive, you know. And you kept on saying you were in love with me. I believe you were trying to persuade yourself you were. I seemed always on the verge of some wonderful experience. And then it never happened. I wonder now how you could have thought you were in love with me. Everybody told me that I was. And they said how well suited we were. It's a pity that you had no opinion of your own. Oh, Edward, I should like to be good to you. Or if that's impossible, at least be horrid to you. Anything but nothing which is all you seem to want of me. 
But I am sorry for you. Don't say you're sorry for me. I've had quite enough of people being sorry for me. Yes, because they can never be so sorry for you as you are for yourself, and that's hard to bear. I thought that there might be some way out for you if I went away. I thought that if I died to you, I would be only a ghost to you. You might be able to find the road back to a time when you were real. You must have been real at some time or other before you ever knew me. Perhaps only when you were a child. I don't want you to make yourself responsible for me. It's only another kind of contempt. And I do not want you to explain me to myself. You're still trying to invent a personality for me which will only keep me away from myself. You're complicating what is in fact very simple. But there is one point which I do see clearly. We are not to relapse into the kind of life we led until yesterday morning. There was a door and I could not open it. I couldn't touch the handle. Why could I not walk out of my prison? What is hell? Hell is oneself. Hell is alone. The other figures in it merely projections. There is nothing to escape from and nothing to escape to. One is always alone. Edward, what are you talking about, talking to yourself? Could you bear for a moment to think about me? It was only yesterday that damnation took place, and now I must live with it day by day, hour by hour, forever and ever. I think you're on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Don't say that. I must say it. I know of a doctor who could help you. They sometimes can, but it must be the right doctor. I know of a specialist who could be of use to you if anybody could. Won't you go to see If him? I go to a doctor, I shall make my own choice, not go to one whom you choose. How do I know that you wouldn't see him first and tell him all about me from your point of view? But I don't need a doctor. I am simply in hell where there are no doctors. Well, At I'm... least not in a professional capacity. One could be practical even in hell. And you know I'm much more practical than you are. Practical? <laughs> I ought to know by now what you consider practical. I remember on our honeymoon you were always wrapping things up in tissue paper and then you had to unwrap everything again to find what you wanted. And I never could teach you how to put the cap on a tube of toothpaste. Very well, I shall not try to press you. You're much too divided to know what you want, and being divided, you will tend to compromise. And your sort of compromise will be the old one. No, you don't understand me! Have I not made it clear that in the future you will find me a very different person? Indeed. And has the difference nothing to do with Celia going off to California? Celia going to California? Yes, with Peter. Really, Edward, if you were human, you would burst out laughing. But you won't. Oh, God, oh, God, if I could return to yesterday before I thought I had made a decision. I was pleased with myself for making a decision. Why was I? And who made these things happen? What devil left the door on the latch for these doubts to enter? And then you came back. You, the angel of destruction, just as I felt sure. And in a moment at your touch, there is nothing but ruin. Oh, God, what have I done? The python, the octopus. Must I become, after all, what you would make me? Well, Edward, as I am unable to make you laugh, and as I can't persuade you to see a doctor, there's nothing else at present I can do about it. I ought to go and have a look in the kitchen. I know there are some eggs. But we must go out for dinner. Meanwhile, my luggage is in the hall downstairs. Would you get the porter to fetch it up for me? When is Chamberlain's appointment? At 11 o'clock, the conventional hour. We have not much time. Tell me now, did you have any difficulty in convincing him I was the man for his case? Difficulty? No. He was only impatient at having to wait four days for the appointment. It was necessary to delay his appointment to lower his resistance. But what I mean is, does he trust your judgment? Yes, implicitly. It's not that he regards me as very intelligent, but he thinks I'm well informed. The sort of person who would know the right doctor as well as the right shops. Besides, he was ready to consult any doctor recommended by anyone except his wife. I had already impressed upon her that she was not to mention my name to him. With your usual foresight. Now he's quite triumphant because he thinks he's stolen a march on her. And when you've sent him to a sanatorium where she can't get at him, then he believes she'll be very penitent. He's enjoying his illness. Illness offers him a double advantage to escape from himself and get the better of his wife. Not to escape from her? He doesn't want to escape from her. He's staying at his club. Yes, that is where he wrote from. Hello? Yes, yeah, show him in. You will have a busy morning. I will go out by the tradesman's entrance and come back when they've gone. Yes, when they've gone. Sir Henry Harcourt Riley. Good morning, Mr. Chamberlain. Please sit down. <laughs> it came into my mind before I entered the door that you might be the same person, and I dismissed that as just another symptom. I should like to know... Oh, what was the use? I suppose I might as well go away at once. No, if you please, sit down, Mr. Chamberlain. You're not going away, so you might as well sit down. You were about to ask a question. When you came to my flat, 
Had you been invited by my wife as a guest, as I supposed, or did she send you? I cannot say that I had been invited, and Mrs. Chamberlain did not know that I was coming, but I knew you would be there and whom I should find with you. But you had seen my wife? Oh, yes, I had seen her. So this is a trap? Let's not call it a trap. But if it is a trap, then you cannot escape from it, and so you might as well sit down. I think you will find that chair comfortable. You knew before I began to tell you what had happened. That is so, that is so. But all in good time, let us dismiss that question for the moment. Tell me first about the difficulties on which you want my professional opinion. It's not for me to blame you for bringing my wife back, I suppose. You seem to be trying to persuade me I was better off without her. But didn't you realise that I was in no state to make a decision? If I had not brought your wife back, Mr Chamberlain, do you suppose that things would be any better now? I don't know, I'm sure. They could hardly be worse. They might be much worse. You might have ruined three lives by your indecision. Now there are only two which you still have the chance of redeeming from ruin. You talk as if I was capable of action. If I were, I should not need to consult you or anyone else. I came here as a patient. If you take no interest in the case, I can go elsewhere. You have reason to believe you are very ill. Well, I should have thought that a doctor could see that for himself, or at least that he would inquire about the symptoms. Two people advised me recently, almost in the same words, that I ought to see a doctor. They said, again, almost in the same words, that I was on the edge of a nervous breakdown. I didn't know it then myself, but if they could see it, I should have thought that a doctor could see it. Nervous breakdown is a term I never use. It can mean almost anything. And since then, I have realised that mine is a very unusual case. All cases are unique and very similar to others. Is there a sanatorium to which you send such patients as myself under your personal observation? You're very impetuous, Mr Chamberlain. There are several kinds of sanatoria for several kinds of patient. There are also patients for whom a sanatorium is the worst place possible. We must first find out what is wrong with you before we decide what to do with you. I doubt if you have ever had a case like mine. I have ceased to believe in my own personality. Oh, dear, yes. This is serious, a very common malady, very prevalent indeed. I remember in my childhood... I always begin I... from the immediate situation and then go back as far as I find necessary. You see, your memories of childhood, I mean in your present state of mind, would be largely fictitious. And as for your dreams, you would produce amazing dreams to oblige me. I could make you dream any kind of dream I suggested, and it would only go to flatter your vanity with a temporary stimulus of feeling interesting. But I'm obsessed with the thought of my own insignificance. Precisely, and I could make you feel important. And you would imagine it a marvellous cure, and you would go on doing such amount of mischief as lay within your power until you came to grief. Half of the harm that is done in this world is due to people who want to feel important. They don't mean to do harm, but the harm does not interest them. Or they do not see it, or they justify it because they are absorbed in the endless struggle to think well of themselves. If I am like that, I must have done a great deal of harm. No, not so much as you would like to think. Only, shall we say, within your modest capacity. Try to explain what has happened since I left you. I see now why I wanted my wife to come back. It was because of what she had made me into. We had not been alone again for 15 minutes before I felt and still more acutely, indeed acutely perhaps for the first time, the whole oppression, the unreality of the role she had always imposed upon me with the obstinate, unconscious, subhuman strength that some women have. Without her, it was vacancy. When I thought she had left me, I began to dissolve, to cease to exist. That is what she had done to me. I cannot live with her, that is now intolerable. I cannot live without her, for she has made me incapable of having any existence of my own. That is what she has done to me in five years together. She has made the world a place I cannot live in, except on her terms. I must be alone, but not in the same world. So I want you to send me to the sanatorium. I could be alone there. Yes, you could be alone there. But before I treat a patient like yourself, I need to know a good deal more about him than the patient himself can always tell me. Indeed, it is often the case that my patients are only pieces of a total situation which I have to explore. The single patient who is ill by himself is rather the exception. I've recently had another patient whose situation is much the same as your own. You must accept a rather unusual procedure. I propose to introduce you to the other patient. Well, what do you mean, who is this other patient? I call this very unprofessional conduct. I will not discuss my case before another patient. On the contrary, that is the only way in which it can be discussed. You have told me nothing. You've had the opportunity and you have said enough to convince me that you have been making up your case, so to speak, as you went along. A barrister ought to know his brief before he enters the court. Well, I'm at least free to leave and I propose to do so. My mind is made up, I shall go to a hotel. It is just because you are not free, Mr Chamberlain, that you have come to me. It is for me to give you that, your freedom. That is my affair. But here is the other patient. Well, Sir Henry, 
I said I would come to talk about my husband. I didn't say I was prepared to meet him. And I did not expect to meet you, Lavinia. I call this a very dishonourable trick. Honesty before honour, Mr Chamberlain. Sit down, please, both of you. Mrs Chamberlain, your husband wishes to enter a sanatorium, and that is naturally a question which concerns you. I am not going to any sanatorium. I am going to a hotel. And I shall ask you, Lavinia, to be so good as to send me on some clothes. Oh, to what hotel? I don't know. I mean to say that doesn't concern you. In that case, Edward, I don't think your clothes concern me either. I assume you will send him to the same sanatorium to which you sent me. Well, he needs it more than I did. I'm glad that you've come to see it in that light, at least for the moment. But, Mrs. Chamberlain, you have never visited my sanatorium. What do you mean? I asked to be sent and you took me there. If that was not a sanatorium, what was it? A kind of hotel. A rest house for people who imagine they need a respite from everyday life. They return refreshed, and if they believe it to be a sanatorium, that is good reason for not sending them to one. The people who need my sort of sanatorium are not easily deceived. Are you a devil or merely a lunatic practical joker? I incline to the second explanation without the qualification lunatic. But why should you go to a sanatorium? I've never met anyone in my life with fewer mental complications than you. You're stronger than a battleship. That's what drove me mad. I am the one who needs a sanatorium, but I'm not going there. You're right, Mr. Chamberlain. You are no case for my sanatorium. You are much too ill. Much too ill? Then I'll go and be ill in a suburban boarding house. That would never suit you, Edward. Now, I know of a hotel in the New Forest. Oh, how like you, Lavinia. You always know something better. It's only that I have a more practical mind than you have, Edward. You do know that. Only because you tell me so often. I like to see you filling up an income tax form. Don't be silly, Edward. When I say practical, I mean practical in the things that really matter. May I interrupt this interesting discussion? I say you are both too ill. There are several symptoms which must occur together and in a marked degree to qualify a patient for my sanatorium, and one of them is an honest mind. That is one of the causes of their suffering. No one can say my husband has an honest mind. And I could not honestly say that of you, Lavinia. I congratulate you both on your perspicacity. But this does not bring us to the heart of the matter. I do not trouble myself with the common cheat or with the insuperably innocently dull. My patients, such as you, are the self-deceivers taking infinite pains, exhausting their energy, yet never quite successful. You have both of you pretended to be consulting me. Both tried to impose upon me your own diagnosis and prescribe your own cure. But when you put yourselves into hands like mine, you surrender a great deal more than you meant to. This is the consequence of trying to lie to me. I did not come here to be insulted. You've come where the word insult has no meaning, and you must put up with that. All that you have told me, both of you, is true enough. You described your feelings, or some of them, omitting the important facts. Let me take your husband first. You were lying to me by concealing your relations with Miss Copleston. This is monstrous. My wife knew nothing about it. Really, Edward, even if I'd been blind, there were plenty of people to let me know about it. I wonder if there was anybody who didn't know. There was one, in fact. But you, Mrs. Chamberlain, tried to make me believe that it was this discovery precipitated what you called your nervous breakdown. But it's true. I was completely prostrated, even if I have made a partial recovery. Certainly you were completely prostrated, and certainly you have somewhat recovered. But you failed to mention that the cause of your distress was the defection of your lover, who suddenly, for the first time in his life, fell in love with someone and with someone of whom you had reason to be jealous. Really, Lavinia, this is very interesting. You seem to have been much more successful at concealment than I was. Now, I wonder who it could have been. Well, tell him if you like. A young man named Peter. Peter? Peter who? Mr. Peter Quilp was a frequent guest. Peter Quilp? Peter Quilp? Oh, really, Lavinia, I congratulate you. You couldn't have chosen anyone I was less likely to suspect. And then he came to me to confide about Celia. Oh, I've never heard anything so utterly ludicrous. Really, this is the best joke that ever happened. I never knew you had such a sense of humour. It is the first more hopeful symptom. How did you know all this? That I cannot disclose. I have my own method of collecting information about my patients. You must not ask me to reveal it. That is a matter of professional etiquette. I have not noticed much professional etiquette about your behaviour today. A point well taken. But permit me to remark that my revelations about each of you to one another have not been of anything that you confided to me. The information which I have exchanged between you was all obtained from outside sources. Mrs. Chamberlain, when you came to me two months ago, I was dissatisfied with your explanation of your obvious symptoms of emotional strain, and so I made inquiries. It was two months ago that your breakdown began, and I never noticed it. You never noticed anything. You never noticed me. Now, I wanted to point out to both of you how much you have in common. Indeed, I consider that you're exceptionally well-suited to each other. 
Mr. Chamberlain, when you thought your wife had left you, you discovered to your surprise and consternation that you were not really in love with Miss Copplestone. My husband has never been in love with anybody. And we're not prepared to make the least sacrifice on her account. This injured your vanity. You liked to think of yourself as a passionate lover. Then you realized what your wife has justly remarked, that you had never been in love with anybody, which made you suspect that you were incapable of loving. To men of a certain type, the suspicion that they are incapable of loving is as disturbing to their self-esteem as in cruder men the fear of impotence. You are cold-hearted, Edward. So you say, Mrs. Chamberlain. And now let us turn to your side of the problem. When you discover that your young friend, though you knew in your heart that he was not in love with you, and were always humiliated by the awareness that you had forced him into this position, when I say you discover that your young friend had actually fallen in love with Miss Copplestone, it took you some time, I have no doubt, before you would admit it, though perhaps you knew it before he did. You pretended to yourself, I suspect, and for as long as you could, that he was aiming at a higher social distinction than the honor conferred by being your lover. When you had to face the fact that his feelings towards her were different from any you had aroused in him, it was a shock. You had wanted to be loved. You had come to see that no one had ever loved you. And then you began to fear that no one could love you. I'm beginning to feel very sorry for you, Lavinia. You know, you really are exceptionally unlovable, and I never quite knew why. <laughs> I thought it was my fault. And now you begin to see, I hope, how much you have in common. The same isolation. A man who finds himself incapable of loving and a woman who finds that no man can love her. It seems to me that what we have in common might be just enough to make us loathe one another. See it rather as the bond which holds you together. While still in the state of unenlightenment, you could always say he could not love any woman, you could always say no man could love her. You could accuse each other of your own faults and so avoid understanding each other. Now you have only to reverse the propositions and put them together. Is that possible? If I had sent either of you to the sanatorium in the state in which you came to me, I tell you this. It would have been a horror beyond your imagining. For you would have been left with what you brought with you, the shadows of desires of desires, a prey to the devils who arrive at their plenitude of power when they have you to themselves. Then what can we do when we can go neither back nor forward? Edward, what can we do? You have answered your own question, though you do not know the meaning of what you have said. Lavinia, we must make the best of a bad job. That is what he means. When you find, Mr. Chamberlain, that the best of a bad job is all that any of us make of it, except, of course, the saints, such as those who go to the sanatorium, you will forget this phase, and in forgetting it will alter the condition. Edward, there is that hotel in the New Forest if you want to go there. The proprietor who has just taken over is a friend of Alex's. I could go down with you, then leave you there if you want to be alone. I can't get away. I have a case coming on next Monday. Then will you stop at your club? No, they won't let me. I must leave tomorrow. But how did you know I was staying at the club? Oh, really, Edward, I have some sense of responsibility. I was going to leave some shirts there for you. Goodness knows what would happen if I didn't keep an eye on you. It seems to me that I might as well go home. Then we can share a taxi and be economical. Edward... Have you anything else to ask him before we go? Yes, I have, but it's difficult to say. But I wish you would say it. At least, there is something I would like you to ask. It's about the future of the others. I don't want to build on other people's ruins. Exactly. And I have a question, too. Sir Henry, was it you who sent those telegrams? I think I will dispose of your husband's problem. Your business is not to clear your conscience, but to learn how to bear the burdens on your conscience. With the future of the others, you are not concerned. I think you have answered my question, too. They had to tell us themselves that they'd made their decision. Have you anything else to say to us, Sir Henry? No, not in this capacity. Go in peace. And work out your salvation with diligence. Hello? Oh, it's you. Yes, come in. She's waiting downstairs. I know that, Henry. I brought her here myself. So you came together. Does she know you're still here? Oh, no. I dropped her at the door, went on in the taxi, round the corner, waited, and slipped in by the back way. Was she reluctant to come? Is that why you brought her? No, not reluctant. Only diffident. 
She cannot believe that you will take her seriously. That is not uncommon. Or that she ought to be taken seriously. That is most uncommon. Get up, Henry. You can't be as tired as that. I shall wait in the next room and come back when she's gone. Yes, when she's gone. Will Alex be here? Yes, he'll be here. Miss Celia Copleston, won't you sit down? I believe you are a friend of Mrs. Shuttlethwaite. Yes, it was Julia, Mrs. Shuttlethwaite, who advised me to come to you. But I've met you before, haven't I, somewhere? Oh, of course, but I didn't know... There's nothing you need to know. I was there at the instance of Mrs. Shuttlethwaite. That makes it even more perplexing. However, I don't want to waste your time, and I'm awfully afraid that you'll think that I'm wasting it anyway. I suppose most people, when they come to see you, are obviously ill or can give good reasons for wanting to see you. Well, I can't. I just came in desperation. And I shan't be offended if you simply tell me to go away again. Most of my patients begin, Miss Copleston, by telling me exactly what is the matter with them and what I am to do about it. They're quite sure they have had a nervous breakdown, that is what they call it, and usually they think that someone else is to blame. I at least have no one to blame but myself. And after that, the prologue to my treatment is to try to show them that they are mistaken about the nature of their illness and lead them to see that it's not so interesting as they had imagined. When I get as far as that, there's something to be done. <laughs> well, I can't pretend that my trouble is interesting. But I shan't begin that way. I feel perfectly well. I could lead an active life if there's anything to work for. I don't imagine that I'm being persecuted. <laughs> I don't hear any voices. I have no <laughs> delusions. Except that the world I live in seems all a delusion. But oughtn't I first to tell you the circumstances? I'd forgotten that you know nothing about me. And with what I've been going through these last weeks, I somehow took it for granted that I needn't explain myself. I know quite enough about you for the moment. Try first to describe your present state of mind. Well, there are two things I can't understand, which you might consider symptoms. But first, I must tell you that I should really like to think there's something wrong with me. Because if there isn't, then there's something wrong, or at least very different from what it seemed to be, with the world itself. And that's much more frightening. That would be terrible. So I'd rather believe there's something wrong with me that could be put right. I'd do anything you told me to get back to normality. We must find out about you before we decide what is normality. You say there are two things. What is the first? An awareness of solitude. But that sounds so flat. I don't mean simply that there's been a crash, though indeed there has been. It isn't simply the end of an illusion in the ordinary way or being ditched. Of course, that's something that's always happening to all sorts of people, and they get over it, more or less, or at least they carry on. No, I mean that what has happened has made me aware that I've always been alone, that one always is alone, not simply the ending of one relationship, not even simply finding that it never existed, but a revelation about my relationship with everybody. Do you know... It no longer seems worthwhile to speak to anyone. So you want to see no one? No, but it isn't that I want to be alone, but that everyone's alone, or so it seems to me. They make noises and they think they are talking to each other. They make faces and they think they understand each other. And I'm sure that they don't. Is that a delusion? A delusion is something we must return from. There are other states of mind which we take to be delusion, but which we have to accept and go on from. And the second symptom? That's stranger still. It's, <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but the only word for it that I can find is a sense of sin. You suffer from a sense of sin, Miss Cobbleston. This is most unusual. It, it seemed to me abnormal. We have yet to find out what would be normal for you before we use the term abnormal. Tell me what you mean by a sense of sin. It's much easier to tell you what I don't mean. I don't mean sin in the ordinary sense. And what, in your opinion, is the ordinary sense? Well, I suppose it's being immoral. And I don't feel as if I was immoral. In fact, aren't the people one thinks of as immoral just the people who we say have no moral sense? I've never noticed that immorality was accompanied by a sense of sin. At least I've never come across it. I suppose it is wicked to hurt other people if you know that you are hurting them. I haven't hurt her. I wasn't taking anything away from her. Anything she wanted. I may have been a fool, but I don't mind at all having been a fool. And what is the point of view of your family? Well, my bringing up was pretty conventional. I'd always been taught to disbelieve in sin. Oh, I don't mean that it was ever mentioned, but anything wrong from our point of view was either bad form or was psychological. 
And bad form always led to disaster because the people one knew disapproved of it. I don't worry much about form myself, but when everything's bad form or mental kinks, you either become bad form and cease to care, or else, if you care, you must be kinky. And so you suppose you have what you call a kink. But everything seemed so right at the time. I've been thinking about it over and over. I can see now that it was all a mistake. But I don't see why mistakes should make one feel sinful. Yet I can't find any other word for it. It must be some kind of hallucination. Yet at the same time, I'm frightened by the fear that it is more real than anything I believed in. What is more real than anything you believed in? It's not the feeling of anything I've done which I might get away from or of anything in me I could get rid of, but of emptiness, of failure towards someone or something outside of myself. And I feel I must atone. Is that the word? Can you treat a patient for such a state of mind? What did you believe to be your relations with this man? Oh, you'd guessed that, had you? That's clever of you. No, perhaps I made it obvious. You don't need to know about him, do you? No. Perhaps I'm only typical. There are different types. Some are rarer than others. Oh, I thought that I was giving him so much, and he to me, and the giving and the taking seemed so right. Not in terms of calculation of what was good for the persons we had been, but for the new person, us. If I could feel as I did then, even now, it would seem right. And then I discovered that we were only strangers and there had been neither giving nor taking, but that we had merely made use of each other, each for his purpose. That's horrible. Can we only love something created by our own imagination? Are we all, in fact, unloving and unlovable? Then one is alone. And if one is alone, then lover and beloved are equally unreal. And the dreamer is no more real than his dreams. And this man, what does he now seem like to you? Like a child who has wandered into a forest playing with an imaginary playmate and suddenly discovers he is only a child lost in a forest, wanting to go home. Compassion may be already a clue towards finding your own way out of the forest. But even if I find my way out of the forest, I shall be left with the inconsolable memory of the treasure I went into the forest to find and never found, and which was not there, and perhaps is not anywhere. But if not anywhere, why do I feel guilty for not having found it? Disillusion can become itself an illusion if we rest in it. I cannot argue. It's not that I'm afraid of being hurt again. Nothing again can either hurt or heal. I have thought at moments that the ecstasy is real, although those who experience it may have no reality. For what happened is remembered like a dream in which one is exalted by intensity of loving in the spirit, a vibration of delight, without desire, for desire is fulfilled in the delight of loving, a state one does not know when awake. But what or whom I loved, or what in me was loving, I do not know. And if that is all meaningless, I want to be cured of a craving for something I cannot find and of the shame of never finding it. Can you cure me? The condition is curable, but the form of the treatment must be your own choice. I cannot choose for you. If that is what you wish, I can reconcile you to the human condition, the condition to which some who have gone as far as you have succeeded in returning. They may remember the vision they have had, but they cease to regret it. Maintain themselves by the common routine. Learn to avoid excessive expectation, become tolerant of themselves and others, giving and taking in the usual actions what there is to give and take. They do not repine. Are contented with the morning that separates and with the evening that brings together for casual talk before the fire. Two people who know they do not understand each other Breeding children whom they do not understand and who will never understand them. Is that the best life? It is a good life. 
though you will not know how good till you come to the end. But you will want nothing else, and the other life will be only like a book you have read once and lost. In a world of lunacy, violence, stupidity, greed, it is a good life. I know I ought to be able to accept that if I might still have it, yet it leaves me cold. Perhaps that's just part of my illness. You see, I think I really had a vision or something, though I don't know what it is. I don't want to forget it. I want to live with it. I could do without everything, put up with anything, if I might cherish it. In fact, I think it would really be dishonest of me now to try and make a life with anybody. I couldn't give anyone the kind of love I wish I could, which belongs to that life. Oh, I'm afraid this sounds like raving or just cantankerousness. Still, if there's no other way, then I feel just hopeless. There is another way, if you have the courage. The first I could describe in familiar terms because you have seen it as we all have seen it, illustrated more or less in lives of those about us. The second is unknown and so requires faith, the kind of faith that issues from despair. The destination cannot be described. You will know very little till you get there. You will journey blind. But the way leads towards possession of what you have sought for in the wrong place. That sounds like what I want. But what is my duty? Whichever way you choose will prescribe its own duty. Which way is better? Neither way is better. Both ways are necessary. It is also necessary to make a choice between them. Then I choose the second. It is a terrifying journey. I am not frightened, but glad. I suppose it is a lonely way. No lonelier than the other. But those who take the other can forget their loneliness. You will not forget yours. Each way means loneliness and communion. Both ways avoid the final desolation of solitude in the phantasmal world of imagination, shuffling memories and desires. That is the hell I have been in. It isn't hell till you're becoming capable of anything else. Now, do you feel quite sure? I want your second way. And now, what do I do? You will go to the sanatorium. Oh, what an anticlimax. I have known people who have been to your sanatorium and come back again. I don't mean to say they weren't much better for it. That's why I came to you. But they returned as normal people. True, but the friends you have in mind cannot have been to this sanatorium. I'm very careful whom I send there. Those who go do not come back as these did. It sounds like a prison, but they can't all stay there. I mean, it would make the place so overcrowded. <laughs> not very many go. But I said they did not come back in the sense in which your friends came back. I did not say they stayed there. What becomes of them? They choose, Miss Copleston. Nothing is forced on them. Some of them return in the physical sense. No one disappears. They lead very active lives very often in the world. How soon will you send me there? How soon will you be ready? Tonight by nine o'clock. Go home then and make your preparations. Here is the address for you to give your friends. You had better let your family know at once. I will send a car for you at nine o'clock. I don't in the least know what I am doing or why I am doing it. There is nothing else to do. That is the only reason. It is the best reason. But I know that it is I who have made the decision. I must tell you that. You've been very kind. Go in peace, my daughter. Work out your salvation with diligence. Yes, come in. Oh, it's you. She will go far, that one. Very far, I think. Well, well, and how have we got on? Everything is in order. The Chamberlains have chosen? They accept their destiny. And she has made the choice? She will be fetched this evening. And now we are ready to proceed to the libation. The words for the building of the hearth. Let them build the hearth under the protection of the stars. Let them place a chair each side of it. May the holy ones watch over the roof. May the moon herself influence the bed. The words for those who go upon a journey. Protector of travelers, bless the road. Watch over her in the desert. Watch over her in the mountain. Watch over her in the labyrinth. Watch over her by the quicksand. Protect her from the voices. Protect her from the visions. Protect her in the tumult. Protect her in the silence. 
There is one for whom the words cannot be spoken. They cannot be spoken yet. You mean Peter Quilp? He has not yet come to where the words are valid. Shall we ever speak them? Others, perhaps, will speak them. You know, I have connections, even in California. I'm in good time, I think. I hope you've not been worrying. Oh, no. I did, in fact, ring up your chambers, and your clerk told me you had already left. But all I rang for was to reassure that you... That you hadn't run away. Now, Edward, that's unfair. You know that we've given several parties in the last two years, and I've been at all of them. I hope you're not too tired. I like that dress you're wearing. Well, I... Edward, do you know it's the first time you've paid me a compliment before a party, and that's when one needs them. Well, you deserve it. Oh, we asked too many people. But you know, I don't think that you need worry. They won't all come out of those who accepted. You know, we said we can ask 20 more because they'll be going to the Gunnings instead. I know, that's what we said at the time, but I'd forgotten what the Gunnings parties are like. Their guests will get just enough to make them thirsty. They'll come on to us later, roaring for drink. Well, let's hope that those who come to us early will be going on to the Gunnings afterwards to make room for those who come from the Gunnings. Oh, bother. Now, who would come so early? Oh, it's Julia. Well, my dears, and here I am. I know I'm much too early, but the fact is, my dears, I've got to go on to the Gunnings party. Oh, I've got a surprise for you. I've brought Alex with me. Why, Alex, where on earth do you turn up from? Where on earth? From the east. From Kinkanja, an island that you won't have heard of yet. Tell us, Alex, what were you doing in this strange place? What's it called? Kinkanja. What were you doing in Kinkanja? Why, it's Peter. Hello, everybody. Peter, when did you arrive? I flew over from New York last night. I left Los Angeles three days ago. Oh, give us your news, Peter. Give us your news of the world. We live such a quiet life here in London. You always did enjoy a leg pull, Julia. But you all know I'm working for Pan Am Eagle. We've got the casting director over. He's looking for some typical English faces, of course, only for minor parts. I'll help him decide what faces are typical. Peter, I've got a wonderful idea. You know, I've always wanted to go to California. Now, why can't you persuade your casting director to take us all over? We're all very typical. Oh, I have another surprise for you. I want you to meet Sir Henry Harcourt Riley. We're delighted to see him, but we haven't met before. And will you have a cocktail? Might I have a glass of water? Anything in it? Nothing, thank you. Oh, we've been having such an interesting conversation. Peter's just come back from California, where he's something very important in films. He's making a film of English life, and he's going to find parts for all of us. Think of it. You know you'd never come if we invited you. But there's someone I wanted to ask you about who did really want to get into films, and I always thought she could make a success of it if only she had the chance. It's Celia Copleston. Can you tell me where she is? I want to introduce her to our casting director, and I couldn't find her in the telephone directory. Not in the directory. Not in any directory. You can tell them now, Alex. Peter, I'm afraid you can't have Celia. Oh. Is she married? Not married, but dead. Celia? Dead. Dead? That knocks the bottom out of it. Celia, dead. You'd better tell them, Alex, the news that you bring back from King Kandra. King Kandra? What was Celia doing in King Kandra? We heard that she joined some nursing order. She had joined an order. A very austere one. And as she already had experience of nursing... Yes, she'd been a VAD, I remember. She was directed to Kinkanja, where there are various endemic diseases, besides, of course, those brought by Europeans, and where the conditions are favourable to plague. Go on. It seems that there were three of them. Three sisters at this station in a Christian village. And half the natives were dying of some pestilence. They must have been overworked for weeks. And then? And then an insurrection broke out. They knew of it, but would not leave the dying natives. Eventually, two of them escaped. One died in the jungle, and the other will never be fit for normal life again. But Celia Copleston, she was taken. When our people got there, they questioned the villagers, those who survived, and then they found her body. Or at least, they found the traces of it. But before that? It was difficult to tell. But from what we know of local customs, it would seem that she must have been crucified very near an anthill. But Celia, of all people... And just for a handful of plague-stricken natives who would have died anyway. Yes, the patients died anyway. Being tainted with the plague, they were not eaten. Oh, Edward, I'm so sorry. What a feeble thing to say. But you know what I mean. And you know what I'm thinking. I don't understand at all. I suppose I didn't know her. I didn't understand her. I understand nothing. You understand your métier, Mr. Quilp, which is the most that any of us can ask for. Sir Henry, there's something I want to say to you. 
It came to me when Alex told about Celia and I looked at your face. And I thought your expression was one of satisfaction. Mrs. Chamberlain, I must be very transparent or else you are very perceptive. Oh, Henry, Lavinia is much more observant than you think. If I believe, Henry, if I may put it vulgarly, that Lavinia has forced you to a showdown. You state the position correctly, Julia. When I first met Miss Copleston in this room, I saw the image standing behind her chair of a Celia Copleston whose face showed the astonishment of the first five minutes after a violent death. If this strains your credulity, Mrs. Chamberlain, I ask you only to entertain the suggestion that a sudden intuition in certain minds may tend to express itself at once in a picture. That happens to me sometimes. So it was obvious that here was a woman under sentence of death. That was her destiny. The only question then was, what sort of death? I could not know, because it was for her to choose the way of life to lead to death, and without knowing the end, yet choose the form of death. We know the death she chose. I did not know that she would die in this way. She did not know. So all that I could do was to direct her in the way of preparation. That way, which she accepted, led to this death. And if that is not a happy death, what death is happy? Henry, I think it's time I said something, so please don't interrupt. I won't interrupt you. Everyone makes a choice of some kind or another, and then must take the consequences. Celia chose a way of which the consequence was crucifixion. Peter Quilp chose a way that takes him to Hollywood, and now the consequence of the Chamberlain's choice is a cocktail party, and they must be ready for it. Their guests may be arriving at any moment. I think, Henry, that we should leave before the party begins. They'll get on much better without us. You too, Alex. Goodbye, Edward. Goodbye, Lavinia. Now, Henry. Now, Alex. We are going to the Gunnings. And now for the party. It will soon be over. I wish it would begin. There's the doorbell. Oh, I'm glad. It's begun. 